Okay, so I think we are ready to start. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar today. It's, it's great to have you. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Stefan Durkin, uh, who is the author of a new book that many of you will have seen called Gambling on Development. And we are here to have a discussion with Professor Stefan Durkin with uh, the administrator, Akim Steiner, as well as two, our two resident representatives uh, from Chile and from Ghana, Georgiana and Angela. I'm Francine and I'm happy to be the moderator of today's discussion. I'm, I'm working in the Bureau for Policy and Program Support. The aim of the session today is to really reflect uh, on the notion of, of Stefan's book, which is this idea of a development bargain, and to really ask the question of why some countries remain poor while others are able to move, move on a path of, um, of development and growth. In his book, Gambling on Development, Steph Stefan's main sort of thesis is that development success stories aren't due to any specific uh, development blueprint, but really thanks to this development bargain that is this underlying commitment to, to growth and development by the members of the, of the country's elite. According to Durkheim, um, aid is not a decisive factor and countries may benefit from it, but only if they've made a commitment, commitment to gamble on their own development. If countries haven't made that commitment, if governments haven't made that commitment, aid can be a bandage or at worst, um, a supporter of a failing elite. So we want to unpack some of the, these ideas through our discussion today and to understand some of the potential implications. So for example, some of the questions are, what do we do in countries where we don't have this development bargain? What about other constituents that can bring about change besides the elite? And thirdly, you know, what about the quality of that development or that growth? Does it matter? Does it matter that it's inclusive or circular or green? So some of these are some of the questions that we want to unpack in today's discussion. We have a very short period of just one hour to cram a lot in. Um, and we hope to be able to have discussion not only with our uh, with the administrator and our two RRs, but also with many of you. So please use the chat box, send in your reflections and your comments and your questions, and we will try to address these during the discussion. Stefan has also said that he would like to try and take the time after the discussion to respond to some of your comments uh, through through email. So. Um, so again, please, I do encourage you to, to send in your, your comments and reflections. So now let me hand over to Akim to, to welcome us today. Over to you, Akim. Thank you, Francine. And since you are keeping us on a tight timetable, let me simply say what an honor and a pleasure it is to welcome uh, Stefan Prozet, Stefan Durkon, who I have had the privilege of um, following both in terms of his thinking, his work for many years, we then intersected in Oxford. and. Um, Stefan, you continue to um, drive the narrative on what in development needs to be thought, rethought, reflected on. And in part, I think it is a reflection of that hybrid uh, career path that you have chosen in a sense, the stepping back in one sense and being an academic and researching um, a thread that has run through your life. In fact, um, Stefan uh, worked also with the United Nations University at one point, uh, research center in Ethiopia, um, then LSE and, and Oxford being sort of the, the reference points and now Professor for Economic Policy at the Blavatnik School of, um, the, of, of Government at the University of Oxford and the Department of, of Economics in the, in the university. But Stefan also spent, and this was a time where we first met um, as a chief advisor in the then made rest in peace Department for International Development of the United Kingdom. I think many today um, are still scratching their heads how uh, a decades long project uh, could simply vanish into thin air so quickly, if I may be so bold. Um, and I think in the journey that you have taken, Stefan, including in the book Gambling on Development, that sort of triggered uh, the idea of, of um, spending an hour with you and reflecting on what you have observed. And I, I was intrigued by how frank you were also about that learning journey that you describe in Gambling on Development. It really is a personal 
introspection at the same time as a reflection on many things that happened. I'll just end by saying that um, I've been sort of mulling over the choice of the term gambling on development and what led you to choose that term. Um, because um, in some ways where we find ourselves right now, and again, the Human Development Board launched last week, the, the analogy, the image that comes to my mind is more one of being a ball in a, in a pinball machine, right? Where anything that you want to do about development is subject to so many different shocks that are happening, the pandemics, um, the global economic situation, uh, domestic challenges. And in that sense, I think it will be very interesting to explore this notion of a, of a development bargain. And um, with that, Francine, let me simply get out of the way and, and again, warmly welcome Stefan. What a treat. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Francine. Thank you, Achim. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to, to, to talk to you all about this. Um, I'm talking to you from a hotel room in Washington, so it looks a little bit scrubby uh, at, at the back, but uh, scruffy at the back. But um, the um, and, and I should particularly also thank you, Achim, because I think in a way, uh, you know, when you were still at Oxford, uh, that one of the, the programs that you ended up funding, actually, this is this is what actually allowed me to to get the time and uh, and and the space to to also think about the book. And 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 I and I'm I'm grateful also for this one comment I want to want to make. This is not this is not trying to be an academic book. This is trying to actually reflect of how academia meets reality, how academia meets. The, the kind of experiences you have to work in a policy space. So I've done this for 10 years. For my sins, actually, uh, after DFIT was abolished, I did agree to go back into government, trying to see whether we could help with the merger and advising the foreign secretary, including who is now the current prime minister in the UK. Let me put it simply, I failed in my last two years to, to do something useful. But, um, uh, but that's the... That's the that's that's the nature of of trying to work in policy. You know, you try something. I took a gamble of seeing can we make it still work, but um, it's it's an unfortunate on that reflect. Now, briefly to explain this this thesis, and 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 in fact, Francine and Achim already raised some of these questions that everybody that scratches their heads and raises their eyebrows a bit, and why why these kind of terms and why to actually think about them. And let me be clear, you know. This is a book at, at the same time trying to celebrate the success of countries. You know, we had an amazing set of decades. We know the world is now in all the grimness and all the crisis and all the geopolitics that we have. And again, that I end up meeting here as also in Washington, talking to senior policymakers within that whole context. You know, it's been a remarkable period. You know, a lot of countries have more than we would have expected, probably taken off in recent times from very low income levels to actually move on. And we can, of course, mention East Asian countries that started earlier. We have done China, but we also have Indonesia. We get to India, Bangladesh. And these are not countries where it's just been growth. And for me, that's a really important thing. I try in the book never to use the word growth without qualifying it with development. And then, of course, editors, they don't like if you keep on qualifying qualifications. And But I do mean inclusive development. I mean, I'm a poverty researcher. That's what I care about. And that's what I fundamentally want to look at. These countries have not resolved poverty or they are not doing this in the most inclusive way as we can. But they make progress and there's progress in these things. Of course, if you don't look at the data, we know that what we really celebrate uh, progress, all the countries I was naming were Asian countries, and now we always get concerned where Sub-Saharan Africa in this. But even there, I want us not to forget that there were at, at least of the, of the larger countries, of the 23 countries that were, had more than 8 million population and had substantial poverty, more than a fifth of the population by 1990, there are countries, and definitely two, Ghana and Ethiopia, half their extreme poverty, despite the trouble it's experiencing now in Ethiopia. And there is also, of course, and that's the other side, countries that doubles the extent of extreme poverty in their, in their country. Now, we look at other indicators, broadly speaking, there is this dichotomy even in Africa of countries that give me a lot of hope that progress is possible, but others not. Now, the problem we have when we go to, to the into the kind of policy side. We have you no know, endless writings have been done about, you know, what needs to be done in a country, what are the right policies. And we can argue about it, whether it should be a bit more liberal, a bit more state, a little more, lit, and so on. But if we look at the experience of countries, where the research actually comes to is to say, actually, there's a quite a broad group of policies that can actually be reasonably successful. 
You know, you have countries that went by the market-based development, others that did more state-led development. You have countries that, that had stronger institutions, some had also weaker institutions when to start with in this kind of sense. And so there is a bit like, you know, we would need to recognize that actually the question is not about some of these typical things that we do, but also our argument, what to do, is actually, you know, maybe not at the core anymore. For me, the question really is, and in the book I spend much more time about it, is that we have to ask why countries are not doing it. Why is it not happening in some places and not? I was at the World Bank uh, two days ago. Someone was presenting me a meta-analysis, so an overview of their evidence on big interventions in WASH, in water, uh, sanitation, um, and the hygiene kind of interventions, typical wash interventions. Now, we know that safe water saves lives. We do not know, need to tell anyone that safe water matters. Their meta-analysis said that actually the impact effect was zero. On average, nothing really changed uh, as a result of the big interventions. You have to ask yourself why on average nothing changes. And it meant, of course, in some places it did, and on other places it may have even made, made it worse and whatever. So what we mean is that the what is not in question. You have to ask, you know, why is it not happening? Why, why are we not getting it done? And that's where I come to this concept that people travel a little bit, feel a bit troubled by, with the idea of an elite bargain. But I want to actually, why I use the term an elite bargain, is that I think we want to look at broader than the health minister or the minister of finance or the current prime minister with her or his plan. It's not just the politician at that moment. In society, the direction of a country tends to be determined not just by the politician who wants to maybe do something, but it probably is, it includes the senior civil servants, it includes probably the political elite, broadly defined, the military elite, the business elite definitely, who tends to finance most politics or keep, keep the things going, um, you know, even public intellectuals all the way to civil society. Sometimes it's very narrow and very controlled, sometimes it's broader. But it actually gets us to somehow these are the people with power and influence in a country. Now, why do I emphasize them? It's because not that I love the fact that they may lead somewhere in a direction, and I would like the people to have a much bigger say, but they tend to have a blocking power. The elite tends to be able to keep the status quo. In most societies, that is actually the issue. We can exert pressure, but I focus in fundamentally it's the, the elite bargain, sorry, the elite uh, that actually determines it. And then actually I use this term of a bargain because of course these are coalitions of power. These are not necessarily all pulling in the same direction, but actually these are, these are, are coalitions of power. Now you could have coalitions of power and influence that actually say it's a great idea to try to control the state to steal from the citizens. You could have kleptocratic states, as we may have known under Mobutu Setsuseko, and whatever the historical roots of it there, it was definitely a kleptocratic system where the state became an instrument just to steal from everybody else. Or you could have actually states that are fundamentally distributive, as people in political science call it, distributive politics, where it's basically about controlling the rents and then distributing them. And we have quite a few, and there I men mentioned Nigeria, where it still feels like it's all about controlling the oil rents and how it is distributed. And a very simple calculus helps us understand. Nigeria doesn't have that much oil, because if it were to divide it equally among its citizens, everybody would get $500 per year. But rather than if you distribute it amongst 200 million people, if you distribute it among 200,000 people, everybody gets half a million. And basically you start getting a fairly broad group of people that actually ends up buying the houses in London uh, and so on that actually can do it. It's broader than a few people, but it is, it, is, uh, it is not the whole population. Now, these are forms of elite bargains of, of, uh, that bring politics, economics and other forms of power together. So what I want to emphasize then, if you want development, we shouldn't take for granted that the elite bargain in the country actually has growth and progress. And yes, I'm an economist. I still think for the lowest income countries, we'll need to get these economies to grow in the first instance. And of course it needs to be cleaner now, but we need to get these, the, the pie to expand. But basically we need somehow the underlying commitment. In a lot of the better off countries in the world, 
we take this for granted. But historically, it wasn't like that. You know, it may have been feudal, but even if you go back to Britain in the 19th century, this was not an elite bargain that actually wanted uh, progress for everybody. If you look at the US, it probably took until the New Deal, where really people were featuring properly in the inclusiveness and that growth, delivering inclusive growth for everybody became actually a feature. This is not what the founding fathers were talking about. That was a pretty exclusive deal, but it actually became much more, more inclusive. And I think we should be willing to accept that, that in all societies, that is actually not, we shouldn't take it for granted. And that's an important part. Now in that spirit, you know, I'm not, this is not again, just a plan by a prime minister. This is not just the health minister say like, I'm now really ambitious. I like them to be ambitious, but actually it's asking the question, could they ever overcome all the vested interests and, 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 and the factors that actually in the end will limit the implementation? So for example, can they actually do the, the serious changes that are needed, whether it's reforms or whatever word to use to actually keep the country and the elite, especially together in credible politics and stability? Or will some players in the elite bring, bring them up on the street and actually trying to undermine uh, the stability of a place? So do they actually have the credibility in the, in the elite that actually they want to see it through? Do they have, are they self-aware enough that they won't overreach, that they will not simply say ideology above all? So for example, in every country in the world, the state should just take charge of doing it all. No, China was such an exception. 2000 years of meritocratic bureaucracy, 2000 years of centralized taxation. That doesn't export well to say Malawi. That's not how the state was built up. The state was built up much more there I say clientelist jobs provided for the people that came. You have excellent civil servants as well. I meet them. But ultimately, the state is not set up to be this kind of instrument of delivering for the people uh, or, or for, for targets or whatever. It is it plays its other function. So you kind of need to be self-aware and uh, in that. And it has some forms of internal external accountability. So let me come to the kind of what it means for development by just alluding to, you know, the places that we see this happen were very different. Bangladesh made a lot of progress and it's still, you know, we can question whether it was sustainable as well. They need to renew their bargain, but they managed to get their economy to grow. They managed to get social services delivered, including by a massive NGO, uh, BRAC, um, and they, they managed to make progress. But they did it in something that fitted their circumstances with a relatively dysfunctional state to start with, with relatively speaking a state that allowed an NGO to become almost more important in social sectors than the state. Which country would typically allow that? That's a self-awareness of the political elite and the other elite to be willing to do that. So it is something that comes from internally finding a way of doing it and that's a success. And I think that's what these countries have in common. I can't talk and maybe in discussion and in the book, I talk a lot about you know, countries where we saw this emerging in Ghana, I think in the 1990s, where somehow or another, somehow an underlying commitment by many was always there for growth and development, but they managed to find a way of stabilizing the politics so that progress could be made. Ethiopia was done in a particular way as well. Now, what does it mean, say, for UNDP and for development? We have to be very aware that when we are working with countries and you work very much with governments there is going to be quite a a, a a spread in it of course in the book i do it's quite dichotomous countries that have an elite bargain for development which i call a development bargain you can work with them you can do anything they want they are actually where agents like yours or where the world bank or the defit they become an extension of the objectives that are shared between us and them in terms of working. And you can really make progress. I tell the people here, including on the Hill and, on, um, and in, the, in the World Bank, in the IMF, you actually have to be more tolerant with them that they may want to do it in their way. And you want to support them in a tolerant way and not having this projection of your own systems, even of your own values in a very narrow way and imposing all kinds of conditionals. And so, so you want to work with them because there is a sense that they make progress. The ones where there's no development bargain in Francine, you push me properly on it. I want to first say that group is getting smaller. That's what is actually the progress. But of course, these are the harder nuts to crack. They are the ones that already were behind and are now staying behind and risking more. The DRCs of the world, maybe the Nigerias, the Malawis, 
They are difficult. They're all very different in their circumstances. But the minimum you need to do is to understand the incentives that, uh, that you're actually what you're doing with, that you don't just simply believe uh, that you want to be more self-critical as an organization to actually not simply believe the minister wants this and therefore it will happen, but you understand what the forces would be that want it or don't want it, what, a, what the elite bargain is around it, what are these incentives, and don't become complicit in actually keeping it there. And that leads us there to actually saying, well, you may want to be at times a bit more hard-nosed because you can't become an excuse to embed a really bad elite bargain. Let me quickly give two examples. I'm really concerned that some an organization like DFID and, and FCDO subsequently, we do much less, of course, because we don't do anything anymore as FCDO, but, um, but when we did it, we would, for example, in Nigeria, really spent a lot on health systems. Now the health indicators are terrible in Nigeria, far worse than they should be for the GDP. But meanwhile, you have a government that spends the lower share of their budget on health. Are we actually allowing basically this to continue by all the time stepping in and thinking we should be dealing with it? Now, I'm not saying there's an easy answer. These children should be fed. These, these pregnant women should get health care. But you want to ask the question at least, should you actually think very carefully about it? Should you make sure you, know, you don't become an excuse for things like that? And we see it sometimes. You know, I picked it up on something like in the elections in Nigeria, the progress in health is being celebrated. Now, this is not thanks to the government, I can kind of show you. And it's not done like that. So you actually give you an excuse for a bad elite bargain to continue. And then finally, I'm thinking even on the humanitarian side, where we always say need and need alone. I'm totally, I was totally shocked and changed my mind on events that I noticed in South Sudan. There's all kinds of bad things, but I flew on a, on a, in 2017 on a UN helicopter to River Hell territory, and we landed in Ganyil, and it was first of all noticeable that there was all these offices of the NGOs and the food aid warehouses around it, not a single guard in sight. So that was already puzzling. So we went to see the rebel commander and asking a bit like, what's going on here and so on, and what do you think of the NGOs? And the rebel commander said, oh, they're my friends. They've been here for 20 years. And furthermore, he said, I really like them because they allow me to get on with the business of war. Now, you know, we have to be willing to critically ask sometimes these kinds of questions. So I conclude, you know, don't simply take for granted that a government a minister we meet is actually empowered within their elite bargain to actually do anything sensible. So we should really be hard-nosed and understand, okay? That's the minimal amount. The second thing, in countries where there's an inkling, we should do more and actually strengthen them, not least in a period like now with a crisis. You know, these are the places that gained and where the gains could be lost. And we need to keep on making sure that they can overcome these crises. But places where there's no development bargain, we need to learn to be much more careful and be willing. Yes, you can't be political. Look, you are political by just engaging with them. We are politically in Nigeria spending on health. We are politically in South Sudan by giving 20 years of emergency food aid in a, in a place. We are political. We can't say it, but we are. And we want to be careful that we're not over-optimistic that we have a way of working around it, that we don't simply say, in different, we were very good at that saying, oh, but we know how to do this in fragile states. No, no, sometimes you have to be willing and humility in saying, look, our role is going to be limited here because we may make it worse and we have to be careful because I don't think necessarily we will sometimes be able to make it better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, and thank you for really making your ample as your your uh, argument as simple and, and concise i really appreciate the clarity uh the focus on going beyond plans and policies to really look at that underlying commitment and strategy on the part of the elite to growth uh being fundamental and then the implication for us as development organizations that we actually be have to be hard-nosed and see where that commitment exists and if it doesn't make some difficult decisions so thank you for that i'm going to turn straight back to akim to see if you have any immediate reflections is the argument too reductive what to your you know does it sum up for us 
what the key triggers are for the kind of bigger, longer term change that we're also seeking. Over to you, Akim. Thank you, Francine, and thank you, Stefan, because sometimes one has to be a bit reductive and, and also um, home in on, on some, let's say, simplifying templates with which to deal with complexity and diversity. So I think we all are in agreement that there is no single blueprint for development. And um, I think, the, you know, I would say to me, it's also interesting, you know, you are currently in Washington. Uh, we are talking to UNDP. One of the interesting things in my experience since I've arrived here is that UNDP has a far less doctrinaire view of a development path than um, you know, an international financial institution sometimes has or a major actor in the arena, which perhaps is explained also by the fact that UNDP has been a constant companion to countries through uh, thick and thin, often for, for decades. It is in a sense a, an, a foreign but integral part of, the, of a national development landscape. Now, out of that arise many contradictions also, as you say, but I think there is an, uh, an, an evolving sense over time that development really is something that comes from within a country. Now, you say that international aid is never a determining factor. I think that would be an interesting debate to have. And maybe, you know, when Angela and Georgiana speak to that, they can be more specific. I would contest that, but I want to begin from the notion of, of the, the bargain. You call it an elite bargain. And I think in, in some ways, if I understand it correctly, it's the notion that amongst the elite, there is a bargain on how to lift the country and therefore lift themselves into a progressive development pathway. That is certainly correct. Um, and where that elite falls apart, countries often fall apart. Um, you know, look at Ethiopia today or look at uh, many other countries where essentially the conflict amongst elites, whether for ethnic, religious or geographical reasons becomes the opposite of a bargain. It becomes actually destruction. But there is a second dimension to this, which is, you know, elites also have to develop bargains with the citizens of a country. Now, obviously, the more autocratic, the more repressive a regime, the more perhaps delayed that bargain is. But sooner or later, there is a kind of um, reality where the political economy generates a reaction. And I think it would be interesting to explore also how it is that um, citizens, whether they are entrepreneurs, informal sector, uh, formal sector, or just um, you know, the rural population, women, youth, these are factors that also shape the bargain. And, and here, I think, is an interesting, to me, um, entry point for international uh, cooperation. Um, development is, yes, a lot about elites that particularly benefit from the status quo, change, you know, can, uh, in a sense, disrupt that state capture, all of these phenomena that we have observed. But at the end of the day, even in some of the most, let's say, distorted regimes, we find that you know, people are looking for ways to actually improve the situation in a country because they know that their ability to reign, rule, or, or stay in power is ultimately conditioned on being able to have some form of bargain with citizens. So um, whether it is a you know, ideal governance setting or a very perverse governance setting, informed choices um, has become increasingly an important reference point for me. Because development is all about choices. The question is, how do you make informed choices? Um, whether it is about the uh, you know, best kind of laws that govern, for example, um, private sector or the digital economy, the startup economy, whether it is legislation that deals with social safety nets, um, you know, industrialization. Um, one of the things that we do with international aid is to connect countries to a knowledge frontier. And I would not underestimate that because, you know, yes, you can go on Google, but it's not just downloading a law. I mean, there is a, a way in which you can generate a process within a country. Um, you know, we, we can go to technology, we can go to many different examples. But I think informed choices is also about helping an elite to understand how big the problem of inequality, for example, can be in a country. Because it's amazing how blind elites are living in the cities in their high rises uh, with their state capture income, and really with no real sense of quite how profoundly corrosive inequality that continues to grow is, even in a country like Chile. I mean, Georgiana will speak in a moment to that. The great success story, you know, of, of the last 25, 30 years of those who believe that, you know, free markets are the driver of development. So um, can we play a useful role, and not just useful in a sort of banal sense, but a vitally useful role, 
in helping countries, societies, elites, or citizens to make more informed choices? I believe absolutely, and I think that is increasingly where, let's say, the development cooperation at national level um, hits it. And I think two fundamental Achilles heels of development are in today's world so much more dramatically threatening to an elite. Inequality is certainly one of them, but uh, you know, through the pandemic, through the more corrosive uh, divergence in incomes, opportunities, and it's not even per capita incomes only, as the Human Development Report has tried to you know, narrate over decades. Increasingly, it's also sustainability. And I think uh, to me, it is also interesting to see how um, in some countries that um, capacity to help a government rethink its energy policy, its uh, infrastructure policy, its digital ecosystem uh, development, uh, from the perspective of a more holistic approach, actually can resonate. Now, obviously, if you have a military junta like the one in Myanmar at the moment, there is very little scope, although even that military junta will actually look very carefully at what its development impacts is on the country or are. Um, very briefly, and to, to end with that, I think the, the implications for us as a development institution speak to two or three very important things that have also shifted over time, because you describe, in a sense, a decades-long journey and a, a kind of learning pathway. I think the nature of development cooperation has also shifted in, in uh, two or three important respects. First of all, um, let's say in 1965 when UNDP was founded, that early era leading through the 70s into the 80s and 90s, development solutions all would come really from the outside. Today we live in an age where most development solutions are actually emerging much more from within countries and the digital economy is just one fascinating arena or theater where this is playing out, but also progressive social legislation, differential responses to, to COVID-19. Um, this was not a north-south transfer of solutions or not even a China to Africa transfer of solutions. There were many different, um, you know, uh, rapid learning pathways because within those countries, there are far more people who are connected to the world and who are shaping that bargain in different ways. Still probably part of the larger form of elite. Um, secondly, development cooperation in today's world has also assumed a much more um, global and uh, systemic uh, relevance that I think, unfortunately, uh, those in our capitals who actually oversee development haven't even begun to really understand. I am astonished. In fact, I am um, depressed by watching the parochialism with which development finance is currently being transacted in our capitals and in our parliaments. It's, it's, it's the most extraordinary level of ignorance about how Development cooperation in the 21st century century is so fundamental to not only helping developing countries accelerate successful development, but in fact for us to deal with all these major problems that we can describe with our eyes shut today, climate change, pandemics, uh, poverty, migration, cybercrime, you name it. Um, and in that sense, we, I think, also need to recognize that, that elite bargain perhaps is no longer as confined to the national boundaries as it, as it used to be. So we need to think beyond that. And finally, um, the HDR came up with a very interesting phrase last week, which I think is also going to be very interesting in shaping development cooperation. The metrics of the future, at the simplest end of the equation, it's beyond the GDP's uh, you know, simplistic story. But it also goes to you know, decarbonization, um, reduction in inequality, um, social safety nets, um, health insurance availability, I and mean, all these fundamentals that in a sense, define a resilient society that then is successful. And then we can go back to many of the individual lessons that were learned. And I think I end with one sort of appeal. I think the, the, the notion that development cooperation is an anachronism and is redundant is a complete fallacy in today's world. The problem is that we are stuck in the paradigm of the last 30 years when really the future of development cooperation is an entirely different set of relationships also a different set of rationales where some of the greatest beneficiaries of that development cooperation will in the end be the developed countries, the wealthier ones that in part depend on what happens in the so-called developing world. And that narrative is one we need to, to foster. And that begins to break down perhaps these notions of development defined in national boundary terms. Now, I'm not telling you anything new, but I think it's just to sort of perhaps share with you how in UNDP, I think we have tried to 
begin to liberate ourselves into a different way of thinking. When we established 92 accelerator labs in our country teams, it was precisely to change the focus of our, let's say, analysis to understanding innovation within countries better in order to be able to inform public choices. When we picked digitalization as the, probably the greatest transformational driver uh, across all aspects of society and an economy, it is because development can actually smartly deploy, help a country deal with this, not just with counting the number of cell phones or you know fiber optic cable uh, connections. And um, I think it is also the ability to take something like climate change and begin to play our part, which I think we have done relatively well in the last 10 years to look at decarbonization, not as a threat that in a sense will throw the developing world backwards uh, from the point of view of moving faster, but actually development through decarbonization becomes a pathway to a different development trajectory. And, you know, the deployment of renewables in so many ways has been a fascinating story that I think we need to study more closely in this. But I'll stop here, Francine, and just a few reflections along the way. Thank you, Akim. Um, I think, you know, very interesting, this idea of, you know, UNDP working to help inform the choices made by elites. And then the way you lifted the discussion beyond the, the national level to address some of these very much international issues around climate and finance. So thank you. I'm now going to move very quickly on. Uh, I'm very delighted that we've got our two res reps joining us from uh, different countries. And I'm going to hand first over to Georgiana, who's going to share some of her reflections, particularly based on re recent developments in, in Chile. So over to you, Georgiana. Thank you, Francine. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor. Good morning, Ahim, Angela. Thank you. I've been for two and a half months in Chile. So I asked uh, the team of the Human Development Reports to help me look into the history of the reports and see if we could gather some concepts some evidence uh, to, to, for the discussion today. So I thank the, the team for, for that here. Um, just um, to, to put it in line, we, we're in line on the concept of elite. So elite being a fraction of the social actors of a country uh, that have the greatest quotas of power, no? the people who have the maximum positions of power in society. So starting from that, um, elites are not monolithic. And the concept of elites used here in the, Chile, in the Chilean human development reports, they include economic, political, social, and symbolic elites who are in one hand, very diverse in these aspects that I just mentioned, but also in their political and religious identification. And on the other hand, they are very homogeneous and not only in terms of concentration of power in decision-making, but also in its social composition. And that's a really important concept here. Uh, as Ahim uh, mentioned, uh, growth uh, has been, uh, Chile has been one of the stars. So just in terms of GDP, uh, in PPP terms, uh, from 1999, it grew from $9,000 per capita to, to 2021, $29,000 per capita. So, and despite, despite this increasing growth in GDP, one of the clearest just processes that we look uh, into the 20 years of human development reports in the country is this growing disconnect between the elites and the citizens. Uh, in fact, uh, this disconnect is really recognized as one of the keys to understanding the social outbreak of 2019. Um, and if you look at this distance, you will see that it is expressed in substantive differences in political culture, and also in a very high level of mutual mistrust or distrust. If you look uh, also into um, the citizens, you will see that um, citizens are a lot more pro-progress and while the Chilean society, uh, the elite is also a, a little bit more fearful as normally it is. Um, they try to maintain the status quo. But just to illustrate with some data also from the reports, 59% of citizens indicated that private companies should not be allowed to make profits in areas such as health, education, basic services, while 74% of the elite believed that they should be permitted. Um, likewise, 45% of citizens uh, against 19% of the elite considered that the changes in society should be profound. 
So these are some data that we got from, from uh, the reports that also uh, illustrate this disconnect. The disconnect has been growing and evolved from a mere distance to now blaming the elites for the current situation of the country. So since 2015, the evidence shows that people attribute to the elites, especially uh, the political and economic elites, the responsibility for inequality in the country and for numerous situations of abuse, maltreatment, especially in public services. So uh, we see this process of personalization of the social unease where the powerful are vilified as culprits. So um, the human development reports, if you look into the 2004, 2010, 2015, you see that people, the citizen perception is that, is that they're living under the influence of a social economic elite that is closed, that reproduces itself by protecting its privileges and therefore violates the merit meritocratic ideal that was consolidated as the basis of this neoliberal society. It clashes to totally with uh, the expansion of um, access to higher education and the concept that if you have a higher education, you have better jobs. And, and so this, uh, there is a conceptual and a real uh, clash uh, today. That is also impacted in representation. So there is an over-representation of groups of this high socioeconomic level um, in decision-making spaces. So if you look uh, into the period of 1990 to 2016, 75% of the ministers, 60% of the senators, and more than 40% of the deputies had completed their studies in one of the 16 elite schools in Santiago, or completed their studies at three academic areas of two elite universities, also in Santiago or more often both. So this, this path has really um, um, shaped uh, 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 an elite in the country. Very important as well is another very crucial aspect is the gender gap. This elite uh, has a big gender uh, spaces that are very, very marked. Now the Congress is more diverse, but if you look into the power spaces and the spaces of power, uh, there is a huge gender gap. Also, if you look into um, nine out of 10 people in Chile consider that inequality exists and continues to exist because it benefits the rich and the powerful. So there is also a perception of all of this. So this is what we found in the human development reports in Chile. And I think it's, it's interesting to illustrate. We are currently preparing a new report and hopefully have some fresh um, data, but also this process of um, the, the referendum that we just went, it's interesting uh, to see the subsequent processes that might arise in the future. One could be the rise of a social elite that competes with the traditional elites. Uh, this is an interesting process. Right now, the Constitutional Convention can be taken as an expression of this, because you see new people coming into uh, the, these arena. Um, and also the result of the referendum. As, as everyone knows, um, the 80% the of Chileans vote in favor of a process of a new constitution. And in the end, 60% reject the draft constitution produced by this uh, constitutional convention. And it was a rights-based draft constitution that was rejected in all but eight of the 346 communes. So it's a paradox because communes with a population with a higher rate of poverty were even more inclined to reject than those with uh, uh, the high incomes. So you see the top quintile rejecting the proposal of over 60% and the lowest quintile rejecting over 75%. You also have communes with a high number of indigenous populations that reject more than 70%, except Rapa Nui, uh, but most of them were rejecting. You also see a large number of women rejecting uh, the proposal. So this is to, just to put more questions to the table really uh, and illustrate with um, uh, some data. Our early conclusion here is that that might seem that there was an elite bargain for Chile in terms of GDP growth, but that does not translate into widespread development. Actually, if you look into the last Human Development Index, uh, you'll see that Chile falls about 16% when it's adjusted for inequality. 
Um, if you look into territorial, ethnic, gender, uh, age differences, there are many people left behind. The social unrest was really a reflection of a rupture and um, that was really channeled in a democratic stance. So we have the data there. The re result of the referendum leaves us asking whether there will be another bargain and for whom. So my humble uh, lesson here is that we really need to be listening to the citizens. Uh, they are expressing something really profound and being on the ground gives us privileged position to support this development path. Thank you. Thank you, Georgiana, really interesting. Uh, thank you for stressing this issue of the disconnect between people and the elite and how that was reflected in, in the results of this recent referendum on the constitution. Time is marching, so I'm gonna move quickly on. We are getting loads of comments and questions in the chat, so thank you everybody for that. I don't need to remind you, you're clearly uh, using that function, excited by the conversation. Uh, I now move over to Angela. Thank you, Angela, for joining. Let's hear about Ghana. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francine, and, and thank you very much, Achim and Stefan, for the opportunity to contribute. Um, I see myself very much as a development entrepreneur and totally optimistic, but also realistic. And my perspective is going to come very much from my experience over the last 23 years working in at least eight different African countries for four different UN agencies. So I'm going to speak about Ghana, but just in general, you know, some reflections. Now, um, of course, I'll begin with agreeing with some of the broad, you know, brush strokes of, of what Stefan's thesis is about development being more than income. And I agree with, with Achim that very much looking at expanding choices and opportunities. I also agree that there's no blueprint for development. We do know what works, of course, but it all depends on, on the context and, and so on. But I think under this chapeau, we need to realize, and again, Ahim, you mentioned this, that development cooperation is changing. We're looking beyond aid. We're looking more to trade. We're looking more to investments and we're looking more to partnerships. And then this third area, and I think Stephanie really brought something very interesting to the table. We, we know, um, you know what development is, we know how development is context specific, but the who and the why is still very much open. And I see a lot of discussion going around that. Um, and I know the term elite uh, gets a lot of reaction because it's sort of you know, a, a little closed circle, uh, but I prefer to look at it more in terms of influences. Right, so we have political influences, business influences, but we have a growing list of new influences. Whether it's the technology entrepreneurs, you know, religious and 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 other sort of influences. So broadening that scope to go beyond politics and and and, and economics is really uh, the context that we're looking at in Africa. Um, a few areas, three areas that I think could be explored more in, uh, in, in this piece of work is going back to our vision of development and remembering, you know, what comes out in the UN Charter, in larger freedom. So we are doing social, you know, progress, we're looking at human well-being, but we're also looking at in larger freedom. And there's a lot that's happening now in the democratic space in the right space, in looking at how we put, uh, you know, we look at the rights of future generations. So that also has to feature into what we see as development. So going beyond, you know, the economic and, and the social, uh, and the social markers, we really need to uh, look at the success of countries in light of not just those, you know, markers, but also looking at what's happening to to some of these issues, which is, you know, it, it is of concern to us because um, in some instances, even countries where that are considered success, successful have faced some of these challenges that we need to pay attention to. I also want to go back to the point that was made about there are no benevolent influences, right? I'm trying to move away from the term elites, right? There's vested interests. Who is keeping who accountable? And what is the role of um, ensuring that, you know, the, the so-called influences are kept accountable for the impact of, of their actions on the environment, on future generations, for instance. So these bargains have 
trade-offs and consequences. And we can't just look at it um, in, the, in the positive direction without also looking at the negative repercussions of, of some of these uh, bargains. And then finally, I know the time is, is, is far spent. I want to spend some time looking at the capabilities of states. Uh, because, Stephanie, in your point, you said, um, and you even made reference to the tango and, and being, you know, having to, to tango and looking at the capabilities of the partners. But uh, looking forward and looking at how this has been evolving over time, you see that states have had to develop new capacities. Before it was, you know, you know, you're working with fewer partners, so it was a matter of, you know, does everybody know the steps? Now the state moved into um, having to define the music and being more like an orchestra you know, conductor, you know, making sure, you know, you have the blueprint and, and everybody uh, steps in line for, for, you know, to contribute to that. But I think even moving forward now with, with a broader range of influences happening, the state also has to develop new capacities. And, and Ahim, you mentioned this, the future focus. How do we have states that are capable of applying some of these, um, you know, foresight and horizon planning um, instruments to be able to drive investment in the direction um, of, of development. So for me, uh, looking at new state capabilities is, is, is very important. Looking at global public goods, what hap what's happening in the tech space, how are you know, the states that are partnering um, for development going to be able to set the agenda and also you know, support um, the commons and, and so on. And then finally, and this, this uh, touches on the point that was made from Chile, it's about the social dialogue and the social contract. What is the capability um, and the new capabilities that states need to have to be able to ensure that that space is opened and ensure that the, there are platforms for youth, for example, and, and, and women to be able to participate in some of these processes when they don't have the power. So I think, you know, I just wanted to put that on the table as some of the areas that I think, you know, require some deeper reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for that. Um, I'm just trying to plow my way through. I mean, I don't think I've ever been in a in a webinar with so many comments and questions. <laughs> and as the uh, moderator, I'm trying to, to read through all. I mean, I think some of the main questions and comments that are coming out are around this idea of incentives. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the, the feedback from uh, Edo in Angola, from uh, Yvonne in, in Haiti and Palestine. Uh, their questions are really, and then Amanda um, and Vanessa, how, what, what is our role in trying to inform the incentives so that, so that elites are um, more likely to, to choose a development bargain. So um, I'm also looking at Drashko from Serbia, who's asking, you know, how can aid help create development bargains? Um, and how do you have examples of how global public goods can provide elites with the incentives to focus on growth and development? So I think there's one big uh, strand of questions around that. I think another set of comments, for example, from Leslie, among others, is that elites aren't monolithic. It was a point that Georgiana mentioned as well, that there's, an act, there's a real heterogeneity of, uh, of elites um, in Africa. And for us, development is about picking the winners, the ones who are more likely to choose a, a development bargain. Um, and she she also mentions that, you know, plans and strategies are important and actually it's about uh, helping elites align with these plans and strategies to build more consensus. And then there's another sort of uh, group of comments, I would say, um, Irena um, is a good example in her comment, um, but also Ido. Ido um, which is, you know, the implication of this is that we need to be more self-aware political actors um, as, as, as development organizations to ensure that these development bargains are sustained. And then also, does this imply, does your argument imply that we need to do more of the systems thinking and use sort of more political economy tools um, in our work? So I don't think I've done the, um, all the comments and questions justice, but these are some of the ones that I was um, able to see. Um, I'm now going to hand back over 
to Akim uh, for your final reflections and uh, perhaps some of your reflections, Akim, on, you know, what do we do in those contexts, you know, uh, Stefan in his book, he, 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 he mentioned some of them, um, DRC, maybe Malawi, uh, Nigeria, I think Afghanistan, some of the area contexts in his book where, where there isn't a development bargain. What, what do we do in those places? So back over to you, Akim, for some final thoughts before I hand over to Stefan to wrap up. Well, given the immense, um, feedback questions and so on and I think the interest in listening to Stefan let me not take much time I will simply offer two reflections I think Stefan we um, I think collectively are in a moment of um, a crisis of rationale when it comes to development cooperation I think the phenomena of development as it manifests itself through a political economy lens or a progressive uh, development pathway lens I think we, we, we acknowledge that in the end that is increasingly driven by what happens within the country, but let's also recognize increasingly a country's elite bargain will in part have to take into account and is defined by what's happening around the country and um, whether it is, you know, uh, security in the general term, whether it's energy security, food security, um, climate change, uh, all these issues. Um, the nature of, of, of our rationale for co-investing, so to speak, I think needs to be reframed and re-narrated so that we get out of this reductionist notion that, well, if a country reaches a certain level of per capita GDP, uh, we can all go home. I mean, it's extraordinarily naive how, how this discourse has manifested itself. And um, I think the, the nature of how uh, foreign policy... Um, defense policy for that matter but you know in the larger sense human security also beyond the let's say Japanese focus on a particular interpretation that notion of human security another report that we put out earlier this year I think is fundamental to getting to a different understanding secondly our role within countries needs to be humbler which is I think one um, very central tenet of your um, uh, book and analysis I fully subscribe to that but not passive uh, and not irrelevant either. Um, so uh, there is a degree to which our engagement within the country needs to evolve. And UNDP is trying in many ways to figure out how to do this, including with a portfolio approach, because I know you also make the analogy to Warren Buffett and, and that idea of how we invest. I think investment portfolio approach, but not in the, the sense of Wall Street, but in the sense of a Main Street interpretation of that term, I think could be very useful. And just one remark on um, crisis countries, Stefan, we need your help also on that in the academic policy discourse. The, the um, embarrassing retreat into a humanitarian narrative and reflex when things go wrong is just so self-defeating and quite frankly, so uh, misguided and misleading also. Um, you know, the response to Afghanistan, we, we began a year before last August to think about the day after the Taliban arrived. I'm still astonished at how you know the international community pretended this all fell from heaven. It was a signed contract with the American president. And then the answer was, well, we're not going to collaborate with these people because we don't like them, but we're going to feed 40 million Afghans from outside with humanitarian aid. Um, you know, this kind of policy is perverse. It's, it's driving Afghanistan to 90% poverty rates. It's also driven uh, Syria over time into this extraordinary economic implosion, which is not the fault of, of the outside world. The problem starts with the perpetrators inside, but the international responses are just completely off the mark. And as UNDP, we have taken an increasingly aggressive, um, let's say, approach to questioning um, a certain bargain that seems to exist in the international community when it comes to crisis. Too, much, too little time now to go deeper into that, but another discussion with you. But um, thank you from my side personally. Um, such a pleasure to see you and, and to continue engaging with you. And I will simply um, have to switch my camera off because I have to run in a moment to another meeting. But Stefan, my two cents worth um, simply with a big thank you and, and a very stimulating session. Thank you, Akim. Uh, Stefan, over to you. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll try to, I'm not going to answer all the questions in the chat. I promise I will come back. Um, you know, 
I want to actually make sure we don't leave with misunderstandings largely and with a little bit of some, some suggestions to, to move it forward. So I'm not trying to say that international cooperation and aids are irrelevant as the Guardian newspaper in the UK are trying to find somewhere in my sentence. I want to simply say that for a lot of countries, the real drivers of progress came from within. It was not from outside through aid, it came from within. We are there to complement, to subsidize, or to accelerate these kind of progress. And if it doesn't go well, we can be very clearly and hard-nosed and, and smart in trying to support those forces that, that's, that change the incentives so that actually we'll get the progress. So, so it's that humbler approach and saying we are not in charge, we don't press a button of development, but actually we are actually our best facilitators and, 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 and encouragers. Um, and of course, it does mean broader thinking, narrow thinking on humanitarian reflexes, narrow thinking on forgetting the politics. I had yesterday, I was in the room with some senior people from the administration, and I made actually Achim's point essentially around conflict places where you say, look, you cannot separately then behave on the foreign policy side, on the security side, then some humanitarian button, then some vague development button. These things come all together and you need to be all the time from the beginning having to integrate it. And it's for me an embarrassing thing to admit, I was in the room for one G7 country decision maker that actually made some terrible decisions of not finding it important despite everybody saying as advice, you know, look, we'll need to focus six, 12 months before on what's going on there. And, and the, the embarrassment that, that, that we feel publicly, uh, we, we know we, we felt it internally as well. Let me quickly go down to the point of some of the, very quickly. Um, so it's interesting what Georgina says is that, you know, and in, in the chat it's there as well, you know, these political settlements, these elite deals, they're not fixed. They change, they need to change, they need to be renewed. And so sometimes, you know, middle income trap has a political economy meaning where actually there's an ability, inability to actually translate the early takeoff into a renewed thing because the new vested interests embed themselves so strongly that actually it doesn't go further. And lots of Latin American countries, I was struck how much, how many book reviews I had in Spanish on the book, even though I don't talk about a single Spanish speaking country. And it's basically because the Latin American thing, and it's also in Portuguese similarly, was happening there. Um, quickly also then, of course, I like the influencer idea. I've worked a bit on tech and it's actually quite a nice thing because I want to, I always qualify power with influence. These are people with power or with influence. And I like the idea and it actually will lead me to a final comment in a second. I want to make sure, and I never really explained it, why do I call it a gamble? Because the status quo is attractive, not because of anything else. The self-interest of the elite is not to change. That's why I call it a gamble for them. We know historically, when they do it, they usually unleash other forces, which we tend to prefer for all of us on the call, but the elite doesn't really like because it does open up the elite, new people come into it, it may shift the balance. That's, that's actually why I find it remarkable that there are sometimes political leaders and so on that represent the elite that actually still are willing to try to open it up. And that's what I'm trying to allude to why it is a gamble. It's not that I want them to go to the gambling thing. It's an allusion also to the idea that the first step of a state is usually what Manke Olsen told, called roving bandits, people just malicious fighting over things to become stationary bandits. They're actually in their self-interest use the state as an instrument to get rich. We want them not to just do it to get rich for themselves, but actually to gamble on a bigger pie for everybody and an inclusive level of the, of the system. But it disrupts elites. So that's that thing. And then finally, actually, in terms of shifting these incentives, um, Francine, I know time is running, but that's, of course, the key thing. And I write about it in the book and I'm not totally happy with what I write in my book. I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. This is always the hardest to do because it's so context specific how you actually shift the incentives. But it's the right framework. You want to in, in shift, try to see as outsiders to improve the returns from good elite bargains and to actually reduce the returns from the odious ones. You want to reduce the risk of the good ones because it's a gamble. You want to increase the risk of the bad ones. And it's in the crisis moment, that's why in so many countries where there was progress, it's so important to be supportive now because the risks are high that gains will be lost because actually elites and political leaders may actually blink and all kinds of do very bad policies that will actually be harmful. So they need to think about it. So we want to give people more incentives. 
outsiders also think, think carefully about it. Because we shouldn't forget that one of the reasons why elites do this and be willing to change is survival for themselves. They want legitimacy, even in autocratic states. This is how I would interpret Deng Xiaoping in China. The Communist Party was in deep trouble after the 1970s Cultural Revolution, death of Mao, Gang of Four, ideology dominating, really stagnation in the country. They had no more legitimacy, they had to move. Similarly, in democratic systems, leaders want legitimacy. And we want to make sure that the, what, what Achim was referring to, that the ideas that they have are actually these long-term ideas and not the short-term quick fixes that don't lead to anything. And legitimacy can be pressure from below. The fear of the street is real. I'm a bit worried. I'll be very honest after the Arab Spring. I'll be very honest that I'm very worried about us uh, celebrating the, the power of the street because we know elites are very good at capture the street as well. And so you want to think carefully and cautiously about these kinds of things. So three things I think we can do. First of all, is indeed working on, on in, in these fragmented places where the elites are, are not there. Sorry, I want to actually say that the fragmented elites that a lot of people in the chat allude to, that makes it even more surprising that we get this alignment to growth and development. And that's again, if the incentives are right, then even fragmented elites, and I think Georgina, you alluded to that, there can be joint interests that actually move us to it for a while forward. And at some point it gets stuck, but there can be joint interests. So we should celebrate the fact that all this fragmentation we see all over the world can get us there. But working with civil society, but think also who you kind of impact, not just putting, pouring money into to civil society, do all kinds of initiatives. There's huge variation. The effectiveness of these programs supporting civil society in the literature will tell us is hugely diverse. In some places, actually in Ghana, we know it's been quite effective. In Kenya, it's been very effective. In Nigeria, it hasn't been. We need to be willing to think that just because we work of civil society, we work on change. No, we need to think about what is the theory of change that we have in the context that we're working with. The second thing which people alluded to is the idea of you need to find the brokers. Angela, what you call the influencers, the brokers in the elite, the connected with the elite that actually can't help to shift it. We do it very effectively. In many countries, we know the people, not just they are often elite players, but they actually are actually keen for the change as well and try to think about it. Now, we can't just do, we have to be very hard-nosed because often they're just words and not deeds, but we aren't a kind of way. But, but, but they can have voice, they can influence other people as well and so on. So the brokers is there as well that actually link, for example, civil society with, with those in power and so on. So you, you work with it. And then the final thing is the international thing that people alluded to. Mm. You know, um, Trade preferences, Angela, you mentioned it, trade preference are a great tool to actually get a slightly better elite emerging relative to the typical one. One that doesn't live off contracts from the government, that lives only from things that are only judged internally, but actually wants to compete internationally with things to do. And actually the idea that countries that start to export, they typically have pressures to actually keep somehow stability, they keep stability also progress, they need often uh, having slightly more progressive uh, things because they're also outward oriented in other ways in thinking. So there's something there. So trade is a powerful tool actually for fairly good elite bargains to emerge. I can spend more on it. The other thing is though on illicit finance. You know, we always say it's all about taxes. No, it's not about taxes. It's not about tax revenue of the countries because I must say there's plenty of countries like the DRC that I didn't necessarily want Mobutu or Kabila have more resources. It's not about the tax part. It's that actually illicit finance, they, they fund the political, the odious politics. A lot of bad elite bargains are financed through illicit finance. And thanks to Ukraine and the fact that Western countries are actually still somehow rule of law countries, we have changed the laws quite a lot. There's a huge window of opportunity to shift incentives of elite bargains now by being far more hard nosed at it and actually impact on it. And then finally, actually, I like the fact that, that mentioned, people mentioned digital. Digital is a very interesting thing because it, again, is an international uh, global public good. If we handle it well, we're not doing that so well at the moment, but if we handle it well, it provides a new way of connecting and not just information. It's also forms of empowerment and so on. We know similarly it can be very disempowering through abuse of social media. And so it's actually an interesting area where 
It is because it is the international rules of the game will determine in the end whether it's a force for good in countries in the politics uh, or whether it actually will be a force for bad, where it destabilizes conflicts, gets ethnic hatred up and so on. And that's a very international thing. So there's a really interesting thing that digital puts us there also in the picture. I have to stop. I know we run that over. Thank you, Stefan, so much. And I'm going to just, I'm sorry we've run out of time, but I'd like to just uh, finish with a, a few final uh, comments. But before I do that, just to say thank you so much, Stefan, for sharing your time with us today. I think you can tell by the amount of feedback and comments and questions just how interesting this discussion was. I'd like to thank Akim also for giving us his precious time and to our dear colleagues, uh, our ours in uh, Chile and uh, in Ghana, thank you so much for joining, as well as to all of you. I'd also like to thank Ida and Millie from the Strategic Innovation Unit for setting up this, this uh, really excellent dialogue. For me, three, so three or four key takeaways, and I'll keep them super, super brief. But we haven't, we've been talking, we've been talking around the issue, but we haven't focused on governance today. And I think there are some important issues around governance to be discussed here. I think the discussion actually stresses the importance of inclusive governance and how to really improve that relationship between people and institutions and the shared responsibility for public goods today and in, in the future. And I think it also stresses the importance of looking at new ways of governing, constantly looking for new ways of governing, new ways of going, doing governance and policy make, making in these times of, of uh, turbulence uh, and unpredictability. So that's one. I think a second is, you know, as you, the term you use, uh, Stefan, is that we tend to have this optimism bias. I am fully guilty of that, as, as Angela said, she is, is also. Um, we tend to see the glass half full because we always see opportunities for change. There are risks associated with that, as you said, of reinforcing the status quo. And I think we are also in UNDP, you know, introspecting that our delivery model of spending projects uh, can also uh, sort of confirm that status quo. But, but UNDP, I think, does have a very strategic vision. We're very much you know, working with countries and with governments to see the strategic vision and where that country is going in terms of the bigger picture and the bigger change. And that's very important beyond the purely technical project level work. Uh, and Akim alluded to our work on portfolios, which is really about bringing that wider, bigger transforma transformational change beyond individual projects. So that's very important to combat these risks, as is all the work that we're doing around innovation, which I, I see is also being mentioned in the chats and which um, uh, Akeem referred to in terms of our accelerator labs. I think the final point is, you know, we started talking at the end of the discussion, I think Akeem brought it out about a global bargain, right? We have to look at beyond the national level to these global conversations that are happening through multinational fora on finance and debt, on climate through, for example, the COPs, on trade, as, as you just alluded, and on digital. So we need to also think about these global conversations and bargains that are happening between countries that are also important. So I think we're very interested to continue the conversation with you, Stefan, on, on that issue and also on the questions that we discussed today around how do you create incentives and how do you support these incentives for change and you know, help pick those winners who are gonna make that development bargain happen. So thank you to everybody. If you want to continue the conversation, you know, please go to Spark Blue. Uh, Ida will, will share the link to Spark Blue and uh, we will keep all these comments and uh, follow up with Stefan so he has the opportunity to respond. Thanks very much. Have a good day and we'll stay in touch. Bye bye. <laughs>